How do we figure out the length of our encoded message to see if we've beaten our target of 416? Let me show you two ways to do it, and I really recommend always doing it both ways, because then you can see whether you've made a silly arithmetic mistake. I make them all the time. This is probably going to be the first of many takes. Okay, how do we do it? Well, one way to do it is to look at the codes, measure their length, and then multiply them by the number of times they're used. So we've got a code for h of length 3, and we've got 13 h's. That's going to contribute 39 bits to the message. And our nice short code for e is only length 2. That's used 25 times, so we get 50 bits in the message devoted to encoding e. For 12, we've got 3 bits in the code, so 36 bits spent encoding R. We got 24 bits encoding I and another 24 for S, then 13 threes, 39 bits encoding T. For A we have six fours, that's another 24, and for N we have five fives, 25. For V we have four fives, that's 20. B, we have two sixes, that's 12. For D, we have just the one seven. For F, we have two sixes, again, that's 12. For L, we have three fives, that's 15. Two sixes for G, another 12. Three fives for W, another 15. And for M, we have another seven. So, let's just add this lot up, and it's easy to get that wrong, which is why rehearsal is extremely useful. So here we've got two lumps of 27 making 54, and another 14 making 68, 12 takes us to 80, and 20 to 100. Then we've got four things that are almost 25, missing three, and 39 making 136, so we're on 236. 272, 322, 361. So if we've done our sums right, we have used 361 bits to encode this message, which is rather better than 416. But have we done it right? Well, here's another way to figure it out. We said that the number labeling each fork in the tree is the number of times we use that bit. You know, we're going to spend uh, nine bits of the message telling n apart from v. So what we have to do is add up all the numbers that label forks in the tree, and that will tell us all the bits that get used in the message. So we have, what, two and four, that makes six, and six is twelve, and eight is twenty, twenty-four, 33, 45, what's here, uh, 69, 81, um, uh, 98, 123, uh, 153, uh, 202, 257, 361. So we've again double checked that we've got 361 bits by adding up all of the frequencies that occur at forks in the tree. So that's two ways to calculate the, uh, the optimum. We've beaten our target of 416. One thing to say before I go is that this is not the only tree that could possibly produce a code like this. What choices did we have? Well, at every fork, we had a choice of which branch to label zero and which branch to label one. And whenever we were building the tree, I always had to choose two things which made the smallest total frequency, but I often had a choice between those. 
So whenever I was pairing up two twos to make a four, I could have chosen any of the things with frequency two. So there's often more than one right answer, and you end up with different codes, but they're all optimal. The thing that doesn't change is the sequence of the smallest total frequencies, the sequence that goes two, four, four, six, eight, nine, 12, 12, 17, 24, 25, 30, 49, 55, 104. We have no choice about that, but the way the tree is breaking that down varies depending on your sense of style. So anyway, that is a not entirely deterministic procedure for constructing the most efficient code that gives each different letter a bit sequence. Common letters, short codes. Rare letters, long codes. And that's David Huffman's idea. And it's used in all sorts of compression algorithms right across the internet. It might not be as impressive as finding a ring in a fish, but it's pretty cool.